Welcome to the Living with Alzheimer's Disease Program for Care Partners. I'm going to ask that you focus through a lens that requires patience, understanding, and support throughout the whole presentation. Now, this program is designed to provide care partners with knowledge, tools, and strategies needed to cope with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or a related dementia. And the program is designed to help provide optimal care along the continuum of the disease in order to maintain the quality of life. And just keep in mind that the umbrella term is dementia. There are multiple types of dementia with Alzheimer's being the uh, primary uh, diagnosis. So sometimes the disease is described as having seven stages with stage one being no impairment at all and stage seven being the very end stage of the disease, ultimately ending in death. There are detailed descriptions of these stages and people sometimes try to fit what they see into one of these stages to help them to understand what to expect in the person about whom they are concerned. And keep in mind that every person is different. Every circumstance is different. So there are other ways to categorize the progression of Alzheimer's disease. And one very common way to describe the progression and the one that we're going to use today is to talk about three stages of Alzheimer's disease, early, middle, and the late. And as I just mentioned, again, please keep in mind, it's very important that each individual's progression through the disease is different and people may appear to be in more than one stage at any given time. And naming the stage that the person is in matters far less than understanding how the person is functioning and how to make accommodations for his or her needs. So as the disease progresses from one stage to the next, attention will need to be paid to ensuring safety and to retaining dignity and a sense of self. Safety is very, very serious concern. Now, the early stage section of the Care Partner series was designed with specific learning objectives in mind. And upon completion of this program, you should be able to do the following three that I'm going to share with you. First, describe the symptoms of the early stage of Alzheimer's disease. Second, explain the legal, financial, and resource planning that needs to be done in the early stage. And lastly, to be able to define the components of a care team and describe how successfully work with each component during the early stage of the disease. And throughout the three early stage modules, so we'll just be doing the uh, first stage, the term care partner will be used to reflect the nature of your partnership with the person with dementia and the ways that the two of you can discuss issues, make decisions and create plans together. In part one of the program, we're going to look at the nature of dementia and Alzheimer's disease acceptance and adjustment to the diagnosis and joining with the person with Alzheimer's disease to form a partnership that will help you to develop strategies for coping with new changes. So let's get started now. And first off, dementia is a general term for a group of brain disorders that affect a person's thinking, memory, judgment, and personality. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia. Vascular dementia, another common form, results from the impaired blood flow to the brain that deprives cells of food and oxygen. So in some cases, Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia can occur together, causing a condition known as mixed dementia. And other causes of dementia include uh, dementia with Lewy bodies, frontotemporal dementia, and Parkinson's disease, among others. Alzheimer's is a disease of the brain that causes problems with memory, thinking, and behavior. It's not a normal part of aging, and Alzheimer's does get worse over time. Although symptoms can vary widely, the first problem many people notice is forgetfulness. 
Alzheimer's disease is also believed to prevent brain cells from working well and communicating with each other effectively. So as damage spreads, brain cells lose their ability to do their jobs and they eventually die. Now, most people with Alzheimer's disease have the late onset type, which occurs in those over the age of 65. And it's not a rare disease. Approximately one out of 10 individuals in the United States over the age of 65 has Alzheimer's. A smaller number of people have what's called younger onset Alzheimer's disease, which begins before the age of 65. Now, early stage Alzheimer's is the initial part of the disease when problems with memory, thinking, and concentration may begin to appear. However, sometimes individuals have progressed beyond the early stage by the time they receive a diagnosis. And we're going to discuss early stage symptoms in more detail later on in the program. So those in the early stages typically need minimal assistance with simple daily routines. Driving can become impaired uh, during this time, though as can the ability to complete complex household tasks. The abilities and behaviors of the person you care for will change, and you will gradually need to assume greater responsibility in managing the household and family life as a whole. And just so that you know, not in this program, but there is another program that uh, we offer whereby uh, issues around driving and what you can do to try to um, uh, stop the person, or as we like to say, have the person retire from driving. But again, that's in a separate program that we offer, but we do offer information on that. Until now, the only treatments available help some symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, however, and they don't treat the underlying cause of the disease or stop or reverse the disease. And it, it's very important to note that because each person experiences Alzheimer's differently, these treatments work in varying degrees and are not effective for everyone. So just so that you know, there are medications that have been approved since 2007 uh, for dementia. And the Alzheimer's Association is actually the largest funder of the research. So until this time, there are no cures, though it's being worked on. Medications are being investigated and there is a potential for the dementia to slow down. And currently there are medications since 2021 that are under a clinical trial program which are under Medicare. And if you're interested in learning more about this, you can go to alz.org forward slash research. Now, families may notice a variety of symptoms in the early stage. And the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is memory loss, but not every symptom will affect each person with the disease at the same time or in the same way. Also, in addition to memory loss, you may notice the following symptoms in the early stages of Alzheimer's. First off, changes in executive functioning. Executive functioning refers to the ability to plan, to organize, to think ahead, to initiate activities, and to control emotions or inhibitions. And families may notice that the person with dementia is less able to keep track of dates or contribute to the family household plans. So in the early stage, the person may have a harder time regulating emotions or may become more irritable. And these changes could be due to impaired executive functioning. However, they could also be linked to natural frustration about recent losses and life changes. Next, concentration changes. In the early stage, it might be more difficult for your family member to focus on a task for an extended period of time, such as cooking, paying bills, or even following a conversation. Concentration may be easily diverted and he or she may seem more distracted. Difficulty with reasoning and abstract thinking. In the early stage of the disease, some families notice that it's more difficult to explain a complex situation, story, or question to the person with Alzheimer's. 
And the person may have difficulty making decisions that require logic, reason, and or broad conceptualization of an issue. Then there's difficulty with language and the ability to communicate. So word finding or uh, name finding problems become apparent to family or close associates in the early stage. And the person's ability to form appropriate sentences and access adequate vocabulary will change as the disease affects language sections of the brain. And the person's decreased ability to concentrate can also affect the ability to communicate, participate in conversations, and formulate responses. And this is very difficult because communication is a hallmark. So it's, it's very important to really listen carefully to the person who is suffering from dementia. Then there's impaired judgment. In this case, uh, there's due to changes in memory, reason, and logic, those in the early stage of Alzheimer's might not display sound judgment. For example, a person who has always made good financial decisions may fall for a scam or begin spending a lot of money on unnecessary items. And also impaired judgment ultimately compromises the ability to drive safely. Then there's confusion with time or place. Another sign that should signal the need for a doctor's visit is losing track of dates, seasons, and the passage of time. Disorientation can result from forgetting where someone is or how he or she got there. So orientation to time and place also plays a key factor here. Then there's difficulty with visual spatial relations. And several areas of the brain's cortex are affected during the early stage of Alzheimer's, including the areas that control vision and spatial perception. Although the person's vision may still be clear and sharp, the brain's ability to translate what the eyes are seeing can actually change. And this may affect the ability to navigate one's world, see peripherally, and judge distances. And these changes put the person at risk for falls as well as driving accidents. Then there's the withdrawal from social or work activities. Now, many times people who are struggling to keep up in conversations or activities pull away and begin to isolate themselves. This behavior may be misinterpreted as upset or sadness, but may actually reflect the fact that it is becoming increasingly difficult to keep up. There are also personality changes. Note that in many circumstances, family members in the early stage of Alzheimer's may not seem like themselves. They may become either more outgoing than usual or more introverted and withdrawn. And they may also display moods you are not used to seeing, such as suspicion, anger, or depression. And these changes could be related to the way Alzheimer's is affecting different parts of the brain, or they could be responses to the way the disease has changed daily life. And, you know, it can be very, very difficult for the person, and sometimes they hide out of fear and there's denial, it's a very, very difficult time. And it's so important, I can't stress enough that when you are supporting a person who is starting to suffer from Alzheimer's, that your support really is so, so important. And even patting them or giving them hugs if they're comfortable with hugs, if not just verbal communication, showing your love and how much you care and how much you support them and that you want to work together to try to move forward. So in our first video clip, we're going to see Alan talking about his early symptoms. We live in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now, um, we moved out there from the West Coast. To, uh, my wife and I were both employed by the uh, by the airlines uh, Pacific Southwest Airlines and then uh, US Air and uh, we moved out to Pittsburgh in 93 and uh, as far as the diagnosis goes I, I had been a pilot for uh, for 30 years for US Airways and 
was going through an international training course to uh, to fly internationally, and, and I'd, I'd made a couple of crossings uh, of the Atlantic and, and uh, was having some problems. Uh, so calculating simple things like uh, fuel burns. I mean, not to get technical, but <clears throat> you know, you launch uh, across the the ocean, you really need to know uh, your fuel situation, and then you have checkpoints that predicated fuel burns all the way across, and every every so many uh, degrees of latitude, you uh, add it up and make sure that your burn is at or better than what you need to, to, to keep going. And it, it, it's simple math, th that uh, just adding and subtracting, and I was having trouble getting the right answers. I was making mistakes with general math and uh, having some memory problems. There's a lot of chatter on the radio, and, and uh, a lot of it comes in really fast. And <clears throat> we used to joke around that you could read a newspaper, tell a joke, and, and uh, not miss a, a radio call, you know, because you could multitask. And I wasn't having problems reading back clearances. And, and uh, one thing led to another, and I, I went back for a check ride and, and uh, failed the check ride. So to recap, Alan experienced common early signs of a problem, including difficulty with simple calculations, trouble with multitasking, and problems sorting among multiple conversations. So next, success means that you have found a way to be happy within the confines of this disease. You may wonder if this is possible. Other families who have gone through this experience have taught us that it is. And we would like to share ways that families like you have found to cope with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And these insights will offer you choices along the way and will help you develop a new definition of what normal is in your life with the person with Alzheimer's. And it's very important to keep in mind that when this starts with the suffering of the whatever type of dementia it is, Alzheimer's or whatever it may be, that you must keep in mind that the person is no longer in your reality, that you have to go into their reality. Otherwise, it can become very confrontational and you don't want that to happen. So it's only natural to question a diagnosis that you don't want to hear. And there, there is a balance, however, between assessing the relationship of a diagnosis and overspending energy, time, and money in hope of finding a doctor with a different opinion. Now, once this is done, however, it's good to invest your energy into learning to live successfully with the changes that are occurring. Where do you start? Accepting the diagnosis is a process that takes time but it's the first step in beginning to adapt to life with Alzheimer's disease in someone close to you. So we'll be discussing that process of acceptance in our presentation today. And once the diagnosis is made and throughout the early stages of disease, the focus needs to be on making plans. You and the person with Alzheimer's will begin to make plans regarding the following who to include in your care team, legal issues, financial matters, future care provisions, and safety needs. All of these plans are best made now when the person with dementia can participate in the planning process and his or her wishes can be incorporated into those plans. So today we'll be addressing all of these aspects of planning for the future. And finally, one of the most important things that you can do now is to live life to the fullest starting right now. This isn't about climbing the highest mountain or making dramatic changes in your lives. It's about living with the knowledge that every day is an opportunity to savor each moment and make the most of it. Have you always wanted to see the Grand Canyon or do you wish your best friend knew how much he or she means to you? Do it now. Go take the trip and visit with those friends. Talk with that buddy from years ago. This is the time to savor what makes your life most meaningful to you 
and create moments of meaning that will last. So today you'll hear from some people who live with Alzheimer's disease themselves or who are care partners and who have made plans and take steps that have added comfort and richness to their lives. So we've spoken about the physical damage occurring in the brain of someone living with Alzheimer's disease. However, accepting this intellectually and accepting it emotionally are two different things. And it does take time. It's important to recognize that future plans may need to be adjusted. For example, one couple who sought help uh, from the Alzheimer's Association had planned their 50th wedding anniversary a year early so they could enjoy the day as much as possible. Another couple decided to move closer to children and grandchildren to spend more time with them. And these families realized that there was still much left to enjoy. Although the process of getting a diagnosis throws a spotlight on all that is wrong, accepting the diagnosis entails refocusing the spotlight on all that still remains. Now there are some changes that are chosen, planned for and celebrated. And in those situations, you're in control. There are other changes like receiving an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, come with little preparation, are underserved and bring many losses. So loss of control is a common feeling in the beginning. It's also normal to feel guilty, abandoned, numb or angry or to feel a combination of feelings all at once. And these emotions are very normal for people who receive such a life-changing diagnosis and you and the person you care for may start feeling these feelings immediately after hearing the diagnosis. It's a very difficult time and it requires a lot, a lot of sensitivity. So coming to terms with the changes that are occurring is really a process of grieving. And we tend to think of grieving only when someone dies, but you know, grief happens whenever there's a loss, especially when it is unexpected. And it's a natural process that encompasses feelings of denial, anger, guilt, sadness, and eventually acceptance. So this process will need to be worked through, sometimes repeatedly in order to get to the point of acceptance. But unfortunately, we don't grieve along a straight line from denial to acceptance. It would be great if we did, but then when we got past the anger, we would be halfway home. But it is not usually like that, especially when changes continue. So grieving can be more like an ever-shifting spiral that can move forward and back many times as things change. And family members have shared that even after many years of living with this, there are days when they believe the diagnosis is wrong. It's a very, very difficult time and it's very not always e so easy to accept the diagnosis. It can be very, very difficult, a lot of pain. And it's also common to experience conflicting emotions. Please remember that it's normal to feel love and anger at the same time, and that most people feel these seemingly conflicting emotions at the same time, many times throughout the course of the disease. And accepting your feelings about the diagnosis and the changes that it's bringing into your life will help you cope with daily challenges, as well as ensure you can provide the best care for the person with dementia. Now, grief is a process that has a life of its own, and it can't be rushed along in order to get to the point of acceptance to make things easier or to feel more control. In fact, you know, grieving the changes that come with the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease requires that you give up the idea of control. And it requires understanding and accepting that your life and the lives of those around you will change in ways that will shift right along with the symptoms of the disease. And within that shifting landscape, there will be satisfactions and experiences of richness and joy. And it's important to give yourself plenty of time to move through the process. And you know, there are support groups available 
the Alzheimer's Association does offer them. They're free of charge. And support groups can be very, very beneficial. Um, it's a good way of helping you understand you're not alone, that there's others there who may be experiencing not necessarily the same frustrations or concerns, but you're all in the same place. And you shouldn't feel ashamed. You shouldn't feel embarrassed. You shouldn't feel uncomfortable. It's a good way to uh, come together with others and share or listen, whatever you want to do. But it can be very, very helpful, basically, so that you understand you're not alone with these circumstances and how listen to every maybe everybody has different suggestions on how they approach different issues with the person suffering from dementia. Now, I'm going to uh, show you a video clip of Kitty. She talks about the need for care partners to get help from others as the disease progresses. When Bill and I went to the doctors, we went to several doctors. We, we um, had doctors that got angry because he missed appointments or that I wasn't there and I didn't even realize I was supposed to be there. I know that now. I've read several good books and I know that I should have been with them the whole time. When we finally found a doctor through the Alzheimer's Association and went to see the doctor, when he gave us the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, he also challenged us that day. He said, this is what you need to do, not die from Alzheimer's. You need to do three things. Get an attorney and get all of your paperwork together. Get involved and volunteer for clinical trials, for tests, for whatever you can to make a difference. And get a support group. And it was the best advice we had been given and it was the most positive that we had been given. And it was the first time we thought that we could live with the disease rather than just die from it. So to recap, in this clip, Kitty, Kitty describes the need to ask for help as a care partner, why it's important not to feel you can do this alone, and where you can turn for assistance. And the Alzheimer's Association does offer uh, referrals for these types of needs. Now, Establishing your care team is imperative when caring for a person with Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. Because of the demands of care provision as the disease progresses, care partners fare better with an extensive care team. And planning and asking for help are two key components of providing optimal care for the person with dementia. And in this slide, you can see how the care team is structured with you and the person you care for in the innermost circle of care. Now let's look at each component <clears throat> of the team in detail. So in the early stage of the disease, it's important that you as the care partner join with the person you care for to form a team. Involving the person with dementia as much as possible in monitoring and noting changes is a great way to reinforce independent functioning. And monitoring function involves looking for shifts in the following, daily functioning, i.e. mobility, self-care abilities, behaviors, sleep patterns, medication issues, living arrangements, and safety concerns and include the person in preparing for appointments by selecting times together, discussing the monitor changes, noting concerns, listing questions, reviewing sources of support. Uh, for example, early stage programs, support groups, and reviewing care plans and advanced directives as a care team. And keep in mind, it's also very important when you're working with the person suffering from dementia um, or any type of Alzheimer's to have face-to-face -face contact. You always want the person to feel included. Very, very important. Just because they have a form of dementia doesn't mean that they have no capacity. They can, you can still have a lot of capacity 
even right till the end. So um, in this clip, we're going to see John, whose wife has Alzheimer's disease, talking about keeping this balance in mind in conversations. I guess the biggest challenge for me uh, is, is just to take it a day at a time and to begin to learn to talk so that Marianne is not intimidated, uh, to not say, isn't it going to be fun um, where we're going over the weekend, but to simply tell her, isn't it going to be fun when we go to Mary's house for dinner on Saturday night? And then we, I think all of our family has learned to, to talk in those ways. And I think to just to, to learn strategies is, is the big important thing. As I talk, to families on my own when I'm with Marianne, and I get a lot of the questions, even more so sometimes than Marianne does, is to try to help people to understand if you're just getting into this, to learn to talk face to face. I think very often, and especially in, in long time marriages, people, and I haven't really thought this through completely, but I think people talk across the room and we talk in a loud voice when we're talking across the room, but talking in a loud voice is very intimidating for the principal person. As a companion, I think I've learned to come together, to come closer to uh, both, I think, physically and, and as, we, as we talk about something, to try to get a lot more uh, into the conversation, into the moment, that Marianne is interested in at that particular point, rather than be about exactly what I'm doing at the moment, but try to be at her level of um, interest. And if it's a frustrating moment, to try to calm the moment. As you may suspect, if two people are are frustrated, it doesn't help at all. If if, if I can be the, the uh, less frustrated one, I think it, it seems to help. It uh, might frustrate Marianne if I'm not at her level of frustration, but I try to be the calming one. Nice. So to recap on what John was saying, it's important to try to be patient and to speak in ways that will help provide the person with reference points. The person with Alzheimer's disease may interpret your words or tone of voice in ways that you don't intend, so it helps to accept this rather than argue about your intent, which may not be recognized by the person with dementia. And to try to be the one who is less frustrated and more calm in the situation. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, you're going into their reality, you want to help them, and you don't want it to become confrontational. Very, very important. Now, the needs of person with the disease are affected by his or her values, literacy, level, and usually ways of making decisions. And you can work together to optimize the person's independence and well-being through physical exercise, which may include walking and or gardening mental stimulation, which may include reading, watching, or discussing something interesting to the person, and social interaction with family, friends, and community groups. It's also a good idea to keep a notebook. Now, many care partners find that independence of the person with dementia can be optimized by keeping a notebook about running the home and care routines. And you can begin by discussing what notes and reminders should be included in the book. So some examples may be putting a medication schedule in a sheet protector that can be marked and erased each day as the medications are taken, or notes about meal plans and preparation. Methods, plans for the day, can help the person maintain his or her sense of independence while allowing you to feel greater confidence that the person you care for is comfortable and safe. And this is particularly important if the person with dementia does not live with you. 
Now, current research suggests that functioning as a team can increase satisfaction and success with navigating the aging and healthcare systems. And in the early stage, you can work effectively with your family member as a team to navigate the aging healthcare systems and to make appointments with professionals more successful. In fact, physician recognition of the team role may contribute to a positive caregiving experience and decreased rates of hospitalization and institutionalization. So the geriatric healthcare community is increasingly uh, considering the innermost circle of the care team, which is the person with dementia and care partner, as the patient and healthcare professionals are more frequently incorporating this into treatment plans and programs. But remember, care provided by everyone working together will always be better than care given by the professional, care partner, or person with dementia alone. Also, I would just like to present to you that there can be value if you have scheduled an appointment for the individual, and if it's possible to try to communicate with the physician or whoever the healthcare professional may be, communicate through the portal if there's one available and if you're able to have access. If that doesn't work, see if the person has an email outside of the portal, make a phone call, send a fax. This way, by the time you accompany the individual on the appointment, the healthcare professional is aware, hopefully, of the circumstance before he or she walks in the room, because that can be very threatening for the individual to, if it's all discussed in front of the person. It's helpful if you can find a way to be prepared before you accompany the individual on the appointment. Now, if it's not possible to work as a team with the person with dementia because he or she is too overwhelmed or in denial about the diagnosis to assist with monitoring, then you'll need to monitor changes more closely yourself. And you can use tools provided by your healthcare professionals or by the Alzheimer's Association to record the changes or keep a journal of your own design to record what you observe. You want to note the changes and make sure to include your questions for healthcare and or other professionals and be present for the appointment, ask questions and take notes. But again, it might be helpful and it's only a suggestion to try to provide your thoughts and whatever you are noting with the individual before that appointment occurs. And this will be a valuable reference for you and the person with Alzheimer's disease between appointments. And it will also help put the changes into perspective for both of you and you as you work together with the physician. Now, disclosing the diagnosis is an important part of the process of coming to terms with it. And in the video clip that you're about to see, Trish, speaks about why talking about her husband's diagnosis is important to her family. I remember with Bob's mother, um, we were married, first married. Um, she had some problems. She, she couldn't keep jobs. And she would, you know, start to repeat herself. Um, we ended up in the later stages, taking care of her if Bob's father, uh, for instance, he was um, had to work on a day that was a holiday, for instance, um, and had nowhere to, to take her, we would um, watch her. And um, many nights, Bob would go over there and be with her if her fa his father was out of town. So we were somewhat familiar. But at that time, nobody knew what was wrong with Janet. And they said it was senility and it wasn't, they, they never mentioned the Alzheimer's word. Um, Bob's father was an excellent caregiver, but he survived this ordeal by being in denial. And um, I'll never forget, Bob's aunt told us a story about how she took Janet to a gynecologist and Janet couldn't write a check. So Nancy wrote the check for her and had Janet sign it. And afterwards she was puzzled and went up to the doctor and said, what's wrong with Janet? And he looked at her, matter of fact, 
she's got Alzheimer's. So when Nancy went home to tell Bob's dad that Janet had Alzheimer's, he blew up and he said, she does not have Alzheimer's. So we, we never really mentioned the word Alzheimer's. We just took care of Janet and just pretended that nothing was wrong. And um, I guess looking back, I felt like Janet never really had anybody that she could say, what's wrong with me? Because nobody ever told Janet. So I guess because of it, I've gone the opposite end and I feel like I need to be with Bob. I need to be with him and talk to him about this and be open with our children and not, not try to hide it. So to recap what Trish is saying, denying and disavowing the diagnosis was more common in the past and did create difficulties for the person with the diagnosis, as well as her family and friends. The decision uh, to discuss the diagnosis openly allows others to provide assistance and support. Though it can be very difficult, but it's certainly worth um, focusing in on it. Now, as a care partner for someone with early stage Alzheimer's, you might assume multiple roles over time and offering encouragement, which should always be happening and providing companionship uh, go hand in hand, uh, as do helping to manage daily challenges as they arise and planning for the future. So all of these activities can be done within the spirit of partnership as you work together to determine when and how the person with the disease needs assistance. And you might need to assist with making legal and financial arrangements and advocate on behalf of the person when accessing services and working with healthcare providers. And you wanna be sure to keep communicating with the person openly so he or she can indicate when and how help is needed. Now, in the early stage of the disease, one of the most important things you can do as a care partner is to provide gentle cues and reminders to help the person maintain an optimal degree of independence. So when to offer these is a judgment call that will be informed by your personal knowledge of the person, as well as what the person is communicating about the need for some extra help. And the person with Alzheimer's uh, may need help with things like remembering words or names, keeping appointments, managing money, or taking medications as prescribed. So people with early stage Alzheimer's disease may feel anxious, flustered, embarrassed, or lonely during this period. And as their primary source of support and assistance, it is often beneficial to be patient, to encourage them to speak about how they're feeling and to involve them in your care partnership by asking what kinds of help they need and how you can be most supportive. And this can be very, very difficult. They may tell you they need no help, but you wanna treat the circumstance as gentle as you can. And remember, it never hurts to give a pat or a hug or if, again, if they're not comfortable with hug, just verbal uh, to acknowledge their frustrations to help them. Now, symptoms in early stage Alzheimer's are often manageable when family members provide some degree of help and encourage the person with this disease to continue living as independently as possible. That's important because nobody wants to lose their independence. So you wanna to try to make it as easy as possible for the person. Notes and shared calendars can be used as a reminder system, as well as a way to stay organized. And we encourage you to find other creative ways to help the person you care for stay organized by tapping into his or her strengths and abilities. And this allows the person with Alzheimer's disease to cultivate independence as much as possible. For example, someone with Alzheimer's may still be able to write a check, but the family care partner uh, may want to take a look at it before it gets mailed to be sure that the check is appropriately written. And a delicate balance can be found between assisting with a task to ensure safety and preserving the person's dignity. And this balance will be one that will be a focus for the entire care team 
throughout the course of the disease, constantly shifting and requiring new adaptations as symptoms change. And just keep in mind, I mentioned earlier, just because the individual has a form of dementia does not mean that they have lost total capacity. And usually the best time to address an issue with the person is in the morning, is usually when the person is most alert and at their best. Now, we're going to show another video clip, and we see Carol who's describing how she and her husband stay active. And she notes how he pursues an interest that he had had prior to the diagnosis, which enables him to retain a sense of self. Well, he wasn't able to work. He lost the one job. He did try working again, but then um, just couldn't seem to manage that. It was hard to focus. So that was a big blow for him because he loved working. You know, it's really important. So we had to find other things to do. I had already retired, but I work part time. So um, we've sort of enrolled him in some, he enrolled himself in some classes, part of George Mason called Ollie for, for geezer people. <laughs> they're not really, they're really very good college classes. So he goes to classes and then he developed um, his own photography business, started getting interested in photography. He's always taken a million pictures. A lot of his shops on trips turned out really well. So we started making cards out of them and giving them to friends. And in Great Falls, where we live, there's this artist community, which he joined. They have coffee every Thursday. Um, and they have exhibits right now. His uh, Some of his work is being exhibited at a veterinary clinic. His pictures of a uh, horse and birds. And so we're taking more pictures and doing more things. And he's gonna sell some things at craft fairs. He does a good job. So being involved in the arts, getting active, we um, now volunteer for Meals on Wheels. We volunteer for Food for Others. We're active in the church. He goes to a breakfast every Tuesday for the men in the church. So he's find a way to be active in other ways. And that's really important. We exercise a lot. I like to travel, get new mental stimulation. So that's pretty much, but our lives have changed a lot because of that, because he did enjoy working and they couldn't do that. So we had to find workarounds. So to recap what Carol was saying, staying after work stops is important. And there are many ways for the person with dementia to stay stimulated and engaged with life. And Carol does suggest involvement through the arts, travel, church, exercise, taking classes, pursuing individual interests. And certainly now there is so much offered online if you have access to a computer. Now, staying active can help the person uh, with dementia maintain a sense of self, which is very important. And you wanna consider the person's everyday routines, hobbies and interests, previous employment, level of education, and activities most enjoyed. And these will tell you what the person considers important and interesting. And you wanna focus on the person's strengths as well as creating a sense of purpose as you, uh, as the partner with the person, stay engaged. So a person doesn't need to give up enjoyable activities just because he or she ha um, has Alzheimer's disease. And if something is becoming more difficult for the person to do, then collaborate with the person to modify the tasks so that he or she can still enjoy it and be as active as possible. You really wanna focus in on what hobbies they had, what they did for a living, if they enjoyed it, what can you do with an, an activity that's related to those um, uh, pleasures. Now, during any activity, attention span and interest may wane. So you wanna watch for changes in frustration level and tolerance so that you can sense when to suggest ending a project or activity. And you wanna also important to plan for rest periods and concentrate on enjoying the process together. Again, if you look at your participation guide and you look at tip number three, page five, uh, you can uh, read about these issues. And it talks about how um, staying active tips that you are using with the person. Now, the next video clip is of Greg, 
who's giving you his own advice about living life with someone in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. We were just entering into the uh, empty nest phase when Laura was diagnosed. I'm not sure that we had a plan of we're going a bucket list, as it were, of things we wanted to accomplish during those uh, during those years. We certainly look forward to having more time together uh, as a couple and doing things that we enjoy. Um, but we got the Alzheimer's diagnosis, and um, that has become uh, our. our uh, advocating and uh, raising awareness has become uh, our cause for that for this uh, period in our lives. We literally take each day as it comes. Uh, I tell people our lives work today. Do they work a year from now? I don't know. Uh, but we they work today. We enjoy today. We do what we want to today. I think that the uh, diagnosis has um, given us a sense of appreciation for our lives and how wonderful we have had it. I think it also has given us an, um, a sense of urgency to do some things that perhaps, uh, at least our tendencies always say, well, we'll do that next year or we'll do that in a couple years or we'll do that when we retire. And uh, now uh, we live what I call the fierce urgency of now. That if there's something we wanna do, let's do it. And uh, that's one of the messages I try to give to uh, not just caregivers, but friends and family, is that uh, uh, you are not guaranteed tomorrow. Uh, if there's something that you want to do, do it, don't wait. So to recap what Greg notes, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease changes the plans that have been thought about and made as to what the future will look like. And it's important to live fully in the present and to enjoy each day as it comes. This understanding can be a surprisingly beneficial insight that comes out of the diagnosis. Now, we never lose the need for intimacy, including loving words, expressions, and touch. So the ability to feel connected to those we love is typically achieved through empathy, empathetic conversations physical expressions of closeness, and a shared understanding of events around us. And for people with Alzheimer's disease, the ability to be connected through verbal and physical communication is altered, and the relationships that they have with others around them will change as a result. So as the diagnosis progresses, families will need to find new ways of communicating and feeling close and couples will face changes in their physical relationships. And the partner of someone experiencing these changes may feel many emotions. Now, if your usual ways of feeling close are not leaving you feeling connected, consider other ways of engaging with each other. And a shared experience that involves touch rather than words may help create an intimate bond. And discussing these issues in a direct, matter-of-fact way may be a helpful shift. And there may be additional factors like depression, an adverse reaction to a medication, a hormonal imbalance, fear or grief that get in the way of connecting. Be sure to examine the possibilities and to talk with a doctor if needed. Now, remaining sensitive to your partner uh, while trying to meet your own needs is sometimes a delicate balancing act. And as in any stressful situation, it does help to take care of yourself and to get support. So consider discussing your situation with other people who understand, whether in a support group, a safe and supportive online community, or with a professional. And asking for help can actually be empowering, especially if you're not used to doing so. And sharing your tasks with others will give you more energy to understand and to nourish your relationships as a spouse, child, sibling, and friend, and can enhance the closeness you have with those people. So always keep in mind that downtime is very important. It's very, the, the individual is your the priority, but you also 
must take care of your own needs and have some downtime uh, for yourself. That way you can be uh, more available in a positive way for the individual. So to nurture your relationship with the, your family member who has Alzheimer's, be sure to gently share your feelings in non-threatening ways. This is very important. Listen without judging and reassure the person that you are there as a solid source of support and care. And you wanna think of ways to complete tasks as a team, such as balancing the checkbook, doing taxes, and completing household chores. You want to try to resolve problems together by breaking tasks into small pieces that are more easily accomplished and listening to each piece separately and checking each off when the person is finished. You want to experience moments together that help you relate in new ways and you wanna go with the flow. If it's a good day, change plans and add something special. If it's not a good day, cancel plans. Trust that these ups and downs are normal and you wanna take one day, an hour and a moment at a time. Also, if there are things that you have always wanted to do together, do them now. You wanna consider what is the greatest value in your life and make time for those things on a regular basis. Uh, i.e. family, friends, spirituality, music, and exercise. Those are examples. Making these values and activities priorities will sustain your well-being, which in turn will help you be an effective care partner. So that concludes the presentation on the uh, living with Alzheimer's in the early stage. Support public libraries, like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.